Peter R. Bregan, M.D., is called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful reform efforts. His scientific and educational work provide the foundation for modern criticism of drugs and ECT and lead the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His books include Talking Back to Prozac, Toxic Psychiatry, Medication Madness, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, and now Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. Welcome to the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. Hello, hello, my wonderful audience. And thank you, as always, PRN, for giving me the opportunity to put up my radio show 4 p.m. every Wednesday live and into the archives on my website. And uh, becomes a TV show soon after. So you can see me on YouTube in the TV format and on PRNFM on the radio format. I'm developing a somewhat new approach uh, that's been evolving a little bit over the last few sessions here with you. Uh, I'm going to start each show now with an introductory commentary that is separate from the interview, if I'm doing an interview. Today I'm interviewing uh, amazing Bob Whitaker, journalist, scientist, who will be catching us up on the latest around the world in psychiatry, the latest big lie, which will just blow you away, and the latest new and uh, wonderful experiments. They're not really experiments because we know they work, but the latest approaches to drug-free treatment in Europe. So it's going to be a wonderful interview with Bob Whitaker. Before I go there, though, I'm going to catch up on the latest news, as I'm planning to do um, each week from now on. So we've got a current news and an interview show. Um, My wife and I, Ginger, we have become very much now involved in trying to bring scientific sanity to the coronavirus debates that are going on. And on uh, April 22nd, we put up a remarkable uh, video following right on the tracks of a remarkable blog. And you'll find the video on my YouTube, the Dr. Bregan's YouTube channel. And the blog's on our website, and you can get to it all up top easily at the top of the website, because now we have a new category at the top of the website, which is the Corona virus resource center so uh in there you'll find all of the things i'm saying about the coronavirus and sometimes ginger as well joining me but always in the background helping with research and thinking uh well we put up just those few days ago a critique of a bizarre and destructive va study that had been put out claiming that it showed the coronavirus was not being helped by hydroxychloroquine and by itself or in combination uh, with the uh, Z-Pak, with azithromycin. Uh, It claimed it was causing deaths. And this was lauded in the press. For example, one big headline uh, was about how Trump's drugs, uh, wonder drugs, uh, causing deaths. This demonstrates that the media on the left, and and I'm just, I hate to get that political, but the media on the left will literally want to take away life-saving drugs from victims of the pandemic if it would humiliate um, and harm Trump. This is a bizarre situation. And I looked at the VA study and it was quite evil. One of the most striking things about it other than the fact it was disorderly, didn't even give you drug doses. Uh, Turns out none of the researchers whose names were on it had anything to do with treating the virus, and none of them were experts in the virus. I mean, that's how bad it was. That's how desperate it was that this thing was created and put out and picked up by the media. One of the things I found was that the hydroxychloroquine was only being given to sicker patients to the very sickest patients. So then they compared the number of deaths among the very sickest patients treated with 
hydroxychloroquine to the healthiest patients who didn't need any drug treatment in order to do well. Imagine that. So you got a slightly, it was statistically barely significant more deaths in the hydroxychloroquine group. But it gets worse. In the combined group, where you were giving both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, there was no statistical difference, even in their skewed data, between the sickest of sick, who would have been getting the more dangerous combination, and the untreated people. Think about what that means. That means that very sick patients, given the combination of drugs, had the same death rate as the healthy patients given no major treatment. In other words, the combination was saving an untold number of lives. Well, I hammered that study for that flaw and many others. You can you would see my blog written with Ginger. You can see my video at the top of uh, my YouTube channel. And in addition to that, Ginger and I disseminated our findings as widely as we could. We tried to get it to the media. We tried to get it to some political leaders. We sent it out in every way we could imagine. And I got at least one communication that this was going to go up lines to the top politically. Uh, among conservatives and the uh, and Trump people, and two days later, within 24 to 48 hours, despite every media, including even Fox News, the conservatives who favored Trump some of the time, uh, the the media who had been been treating this as a scientific study, were talking about it as hokum, and then the secretary of the VA and other members of the VA had to make a tour of the media stating that this study was not scientific, that it had a lot of problems, and furthermore, furthermore, that the VA had found that the drug was very useful in treating patients who were younger or in their middle years. Now we're waiting to see really what about even the patients who are older and sicker. And I think we're gonna find that these drugs are very, very helpful. I wanna repeat that it's just a disaster that's going on now in terms of the media being willing to sacrifice lives in order to try to, to humiliate President Trump. And I also want to describe this terribly new phenomenon that I'll be talking about, which is the creation of fake research to use in the fake media. Let me do a brief summary of my impressions at this point of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Hydroxychloroquine is one of the safest drugs I have ever seen. I have been a critic of psychiatric drugs and other drugs when dangerous for decades. Hydroxychloroquine appears to be effective. We're learning more about it, but it appears to be effective at all stages of the disease, but particularly early on, as well as being safe. And the combination, while less safe, we have some hints now, may be better when it comes to the very ill. Well, thanks for taking this seriously. Thanks for listening to this. And now we're gonna to go to a wonderful interview with Robert Whitaker, who has some stunning news about the biggest lies in psychiatry getting bigger and bigger and bigger, while meanwhile, encouragingly, in Europe, there's more and more good news about drug-free approaches. Thank you. Well, my interview today is with marvelous, wonderful Robert Whitaker. 
I think that Robert Whitaker is the most important person in the psychiatric reform movement in many, many ways. First of all, he has traveled around the world speaking truth to anybody who would listen for how many years? How many years now, Bob, have you been traveling talking about these issues? Well, in a way, it began in 2003, but it really took off in 2011. So, And I've been to, I don't know how many countries, 30, 35. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to really miss Bob because during the shutdown, I don't travel, he doesn't travel. And the only time I ever see him is now on my video show. <laughs> so I'm going to my radio TV show. So I'm going to uh, have uh, Bob on uh, uh, more often if he consents to it. Um, I think Bob has done some of the very best research. He's a journalist, which I think is a false distinction. He's actually a researcher, and that makes him a scientist. And that's what a good journalist should be. But it's a really a rare phenomena today. So Bob's really a scientist, and he's written two books that are particularly important to me, Mad in America, An Epidemic of an Ana Anatomy of an Epidemic. And both of those uh, books brought new information to me that I hadn't seen, elaborated on ideas that I'd been working on for decades and came up with new approaches. Um, he has really spread the information by his books and by his uh, deeds out in the world. The other thing he's done is he's created Mad in America, this incredible website. Oh, and also uh, he really created the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health. I mean, there's so much he's done. And I, I don't imagine that uh, people understand this well enough to actually give you such a specific and poignant introduction because it's hard to grasp just in a few words what one person like Bob who's been doing this for so long um, has accomplished. Uh, Madden America is a very, very good website that brings together a lot of different views, <clears throat> including some more moderate views, but also the best of the critiques of psychiatry. And very often when I write a blog, I put it up on Madden America, and I also put them up, uh, you know, links to it from my website. And now, increasingly at times, I even blog right off my own website. But um, I will keep coming back to Madden America and begging them to put up my uh, uh, my blog so that the folks in the world can can see this stuff. Uh, Bob, you're looking good. You look really good. Um, what are you, how have you been faring during the shutdown? I think we, we should, all my guests should start out talking about the shutdown. But let me say first, before we go there, we're going to cover, folks, two of the single most important issues today. You're going to get the hottest, freshest, best news in science, but two of the single most important issues ever in the field of psychiatry and hence in medicine. And one of the issues is going to be what Norway is doing since they have uh, declared that the option of drug-free psychiatric treatment should be made available, which is another of Bob's accomplishments. He'll explain to you how it began, but it's, I don't know that it exists without Bob. And the second issue, which is in their desperation, psychiatrists are now claiming that, a, that the highly poisonous neuroleptic drugs, which the best studies show shorten lifespan by up to a couple of decades in some of the studies, actually are lengthening the lifespan. So, you know, it's a Goebbels big lie. You know, he used to say you make a lie big, 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 big for Hitler. And the bigger, the better, the more likely people will somehow believe it. I don't think people are going to believe this one. So I want to unleash Bob on these two extremely important uh, issues. Begin either way with the anti-psychotic uh, fraud studies, which I, I think they're going to turn out to be fraud. And um, also, uh, hey, good news coming out of a country, a little tiny country, Norway, that I have been well received in in the past with my lectures. Uh, Bob. Well, first of all, thank you for that very nice in <laughs> introduction, Peter. That's very kind. And well, it's true. It's exactly factual. Well, thank you. I'll just tell you in terms of uh, where I'm at during this 
time of uh, social isolation or distancing, whatever you want to call it. I had the very good fortune to um, be in Western Massachusetts, out in the country, so we can take walks. And um, so there's really no strain on me, uh, to be honest with you, because I get to be in nature, and nature is its own sort of balm, I think, outside, et cetera. Oh, we have research studies showing. <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's really good. The biggest yeah. stra stra stress for me is related to my daughters. They both live in New York City. Uh, one's a oh. nurse in a hospital treating COVID patients. She's got oh, two dear. kids. So, uh, you know, that makes you nervous. It's, and they have two young kids, so, you know, she's going back and forth. And then it's interesting, my other daughter is a, a teacher of high school kids in Brooklyn, a uh, very poor school. And so she's seeing some of the stresses that are on poorer families, of course, you know, uh, single parent families during this time. A lot of the uh, parents of her students are, you know, health aides, that sort of thing. So she's getting a real eyeful of the stresses that, um, you know, th this whole thing is putting on, on, on people you know, are living sort of hand to mouth, you know, don't have savings, that sort of thing. So uh, yeah. for me, it's very lucky. <laughs> I mean, I'm out in the countryside. I'm okay. Yeah. But that's the stress for me. It's really sort of a family stress. Uh, so that's that. Uh, you miss traveling around the world? I do. Because um, typically these are travels where I learn a lot, meet great people. <laughs> So it's not just being a tourist, it's it's going and learning about, you know, initiatives and generally meeting people who are trying to make radical change within psychiatry. So I missed that. I was supposed to go to Spain, uh, like literally I was a day away from getting on a plane when they basically shut everything down. So I'm glad I didn't get there. And I was supposed to be in Italy next week, but of course that conference got, got canceled. So, um, you know, you just count your blessings during this time. And, I'm healthy and have food and yeah. walk in nature. So uh, I'm sure it'll all get back to normal at some point. At least I hope so. All right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, well, let tell us what you've been learning about uh, antipsychotic drugs and also about drug-free treatment. They're so closely related. Yeah, they, they, they really are all part of the same sort of larger arc of a story. I mean, I think the biggest thing that is that, that, sort of, I think even within mainstream psychiatry now, they have to admit they have no evidence. This is going to be obvious to you, Peter, but let's remember where we are. Uh, they, they have no evidence that antipsychotics, quote, improve long-term outcomes, even though they're using them on the long-term. They really, if, if, if when they try to defend their long-term use, they can't point to studies that show that they improve long-term outcomes on any domain of functioning, yeah. symptoms, hospitalization, uh, socialization, employment, et cetera. And you know, as you know, they've always used this thing where they do relapse studies, where they take people on the drugs, they abruptly withdraw one half, and they say, see what happens to those you withdraw, they go, and they relapse. Anyway, there is an acknowledgement, A, we don't have evidence at this time. Everyone admits this, that antipsychotics improve long-term outcomes on any domain of function. Uh, whether it be in terms of symptoms long term, hospitalization, employment rates, socialization. So, as you know, if you're going to claim you're the evidence based practice, that that's what your discipline does, you should have evidence showing that what you're doing improves long term outcomes. That's collapsed. It really has. So, that's opening up, first of all, some chances to wedge in change. Also, the thing is, we're going to get in a moment to this claim that antipsychotics reduce mortality, but this claim is being made even as people diagnosed with schizophrenia or, you know, other, quote, serious mental illnesses, they're dying 20, 25 years early. So it's a little, I, a little odd to say that you have a treatment that reduces mortality even while this a mortality gap goes greater. And then the final thing is we've had a number of studies in the last 10 years that actually have found that people off antipsychotics including people diagnosed with schizophrenia, have better long-term outcomes. They're more likely to recover. So that's the sort of stage where we're reaching. Now, how did we get here, Peter? Well, your work, as you know, made yeah. was, was the wedge into this whole you know, story. And this goes mm -hmm. back to the 90s. Oh, Bob, 1983. 
psychiatric oh, okay. drugs, yeah. hazards to the brain. Yeah, yeah. And, and then that, toxic psychiatry was... Look, that was the popular. That was the that mass was market. It was toxic psychiatry. Right. But 1983 is my first, my second medical book. My first one's 1979 um, about the ECT. And then my first one about drugs was 83. And I talked about all these issues. The focus of the book, about a third of the book, was on the antipsychotic drugs. Psychiatric drugs. Psychiatric drugs, hazards to the brain. It wasn't brain disabling treatments in psychiatry or something like that. That's that is the uh, reincarnation of it. It okay. then became in its next edition, brain disabling treatments in psychiatry, and now it's brain disabling treatments in psychiatry, second edition. Okay. And folks, you'll find pretty much everything Bob is saying here um, so far. What you won't find is some of these wonderful new uh, approaches to treatment, like Norway. That's not going to find in that book, and that's this is very, very new stuff. But go ahead, Bob. Well, I just want to say also, Peter, so you do these books in the 80s and 90s, and you're seeing all the hazards and harms associated <clears throat> with those drugs. What has happened, of course, it, in essence, we've gotten more studies that proved you're right, so to speak. Yeah. So we, have, uh, we now have long-term studies like from Martin Harrell that found that the recovery rate was eight times higher for people diagnosed with schizophrenia off medication. And, and Harrell also found in his long-term study that it was the medicated people who are more likely to remain symptomatic and that it was having psychotic symptoms long-term. That brought up this idea that the drugs actually increase your biological vulnerability to psychosis, things that you've been writing about a long time. But what I, I'm, I think what has happened is we've had these new studies so often meant to prove that the drugs are great that have actually found uh, that they're not working, so to speak. So what I'm trying to say is the evidence against antipsychotics continues to grow. Right. And so now let's go what's happening in Norway, because what's happening in Norway is so encouraging. And at the same time, there's a discouraging note. Bob, should we go there first or... Let's go to the to the idea that they're shortening lifespan, these okay, drugs, because sure. they are. And you said something which the first time I realized it, uh, you know, quite a few years ago, first time it turned up, that people taking antipsychotic drugs, now that's like Zyprexa and Risperdal and Haldol and name a few more, um, Seroquel, you know, <clears throat> yeah. these drugs in Vega, that they literally losing uh, 20, 25 years of life. Um, I mean, it's in my books, but it still stuns me to hear it, and it's going to stun people to hear it. So maybe it'll be interesting now to go to the claim that, oh, no, it's the reverse. How could they, how could they turn truth totally on its head? Well, first of all, where did this... <laughs> When did we start getting this information that it might be lengthening life? Well, it happens right after 2006. There's a report by state hospital directors uh, in the United States that says, uh-oh, the mortality gap. In other words, how much earlier are people with diagnosed with schizophrenia or even you know, other serious mental disorders dying? They say it's up to 25 years early now. So right. people are dying in their late 40s, their 50s. And clearly that raises a question could it be the drugs? Especially when you see how the drugs change people physically, you know, causing obesity, diabetes, respiratory problems. We all know these are risk factors for yes, neurological yeah. problems. Yeah. So what you find is really interesting. So you have a 2006 report that says uh, 25 years mortality gap. Then there's a report by Australian investigators that looked at the uh, mortality gap, how it was growing since the 70s. And so what they noticed, it grew from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, and it was increasing. It was worsening in this time when we have ever more emphasis on antipsychotics. It was, it was working, worsening for people with bipolar too. And what happened once we got the second quote, second generation antipsychotics, we started uh, using those more regularly to treat people so diagnosed. So there was a real crisis with this at 2006, 2007. And then two years later, we get a, uh, we get a, a publication in Lancet out of uh, Finland by a guy named Tihonen, Yari Tihonen, that says, 
Antipsychotics taken continually have, if you compare in a group of people in, in Finland diagnosed with schizophrenia, it's those over 11 year period who take the antipsychotics most regularly who are most likely to survive. And the group least likely to survive is those who don't take any antipsychotics. So all of a sudden you get this thing saying antipsychotics reduce uh, mortality, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, how did they do that study? Well, first of all, you have to know who Tionen is. He uh, is a consultant, advisor, speaker to every manufacturer of antipsychotics. It's like 10 different companies, okay? Spell his name, his last name. It's T-I-I-H-O-N-E-N. And most all of this research is coming from his group, okay? So the way he does it, is he looks into uh, three databases. It's a database of everyone diagnosed with schizophrenia in Finland that goes back to 66. Then starting in 1996, he has an outpatient uh, prescription database and he can see if someone filled the prescription for an, uh, for, um, an antipsychotic. And then he, he's got death records. So what he does is he identifies all the people diagnosed starting in 1965. And then he follows them from 1995 to 2006. Okay, and he says, look, and it's the people who take their drugs all the time who have the lowest survival rate. So how does he do it, Peter? Well, lowest first, death rate. Lowest death, lowest death rate. Lowest, oh, yeah. sorry. The lowest death rate is among death those rate. who take it the longest time. Well, first of all, who is this group is not taking antipsychotics over this long period of time? Well, it's an old group. It's a much mm. older group. Much older group. Oh, well, perfect yeah. control. Much older people. So you can see that, but it's hidden, okay? Then the second thing is, they just lie. By that I mean is if you actually look at their data, the group that has the uh, lowest mortality rate is the group over 11 year period that used the drug six months or less. But what they do is they compare their continually maintained people to that older group that probably was already dying from other reasons. You know what I mean? They may have been on the drugs yeah. for 25 years. Yeah. And they say, look, it's, uh, people uh, live longer on, on who take the drugs continuously. But literally, in their own study, they show it's, it's zero to six months or less. Now, Peter, a little bit of insight on this. Believe it or not, I was asked by Lancet to be a peer reviewer of this when it first came in. Mm -hmm. And when it first came in, here's how they were charting up their deaths. Bob, things are shaking a little on your Oh, end. sorry. That's me. It's just like me. You get a little into it, and I start tapping my feet. So oh, anyway. This is fabulous, inf Bob, fabulous information. Go ahead. Okay. So here's how they were recording deaths initially. So let's say I'm on drugs for six years during this time. And now I'm falling apart because I've got diabetes and respiratory problems, et cetera. And then... Be because I'm in such bad shape, I come off the drugs, okay? Oh, and you get counted as uh, not off taking the drugs. Yes. So I be on the drug for 20 years. This is how they initially designed the study. And if I come off for, for a month or two months, my drug is, my death is being charted up to being off medication. Yeah. So, which is just obviously sort of a fraud. What I said right. is, oh, I said, what my response was, you got to do it over drug exposure times. So they did come back and do it over exposure times, but they had this. So you actually said that on your review. Yeah. And that Lance agreed with me. Lance had agreed. Right. But then they came back and, and did do it exposure. But I don't know what happened, Peter. I missed this sort of key graphic that shows it was actually those with zero to six months that had their uh, lowest oh, uh, death rate. Anyway, well, folks, let me just say these articles are so convoluted. There's so much thrown at you. I have found uh, that I've missed things every time I read one of these, yeah, yeah. some of these articles. They're really I mean, there's so much fraud manipulation going on. And then imagine what they're doing that never surfaces into the article. Yeah, exactly. That you can't even sniff out. Well, and this idea that they were much older, you, it's, it's, you can sniff it out, but it's not like they let you know, okay? Yeah. You have to see it in some adjustments they made. Anyway, if you go forward, that's an exposure study, okay, which really tells another story. Then there's two other types of study they've used to this. So, Peter, imagine first episode people go into the hospital. Everyone's put on antipsychotics, right? Uh, with younger people. You're 22 years old. 
you go in the hospital, sometimes they forcibly medicate you. Now you get discharged and they tell you, you got to take these drugs you don't like for life, right? And now you get discharged and you have this new diagnosis saying you're chronically ill. What happens to a lot of people when they come out of the hospital? They kill themselves. Oh, my. So you see this <clears throat> really high suicide rate with first episode patients who are medicated in the hospital. They come out. They say, I don't want to take my drugs. Uh, and, and, and you do see a really high suicide rate. That gets charged to being off medication. It doesn't get charted up to a paradigm of care, which forcibly treats people with drugs they hate. And then, and we all know that once you're on these drugs, if you just throw them away abruptly, it's, it's a difficult time, right? Uh, severe psychosis, that sort of thing. Plus, if you reject that paradigm of care, you come out, you now have a lot of social opposition, right? Yeah. So what they do is they chart this risk that is related to the paradigm of care to being off medication. That's the second thing they do. And then the, with that immediate discharge. And then the final thing, they just had a paper that really said this. They looked at people filling a, um, they looked at a 20 year period of these outpatient prescriptions. By the way, it starts in 96. So all your medication exposure prior to that doesn't get counted. They also don't know what happens in the hospital either. So that doesn't get counted. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they basically said in this last study, you're more likely to die in the months you come off your medication than when you're on. So you can see what they're doing with this as well. Uh, oh, but there's some statistical sleight of hand with this as well. But what they're doing is that time when you come off initially, there is a risk there. That's clearly you've been on the drugs, you throw them away, there is a heightened risk for time. Um, the other thing they do is, they don't actually give you the real data. So they do something called person years data. So let's imagine I'm someone on a drug during this study for seven years and I don't die. That's seven years of survival free. Now I go off my drug and I have terrible you know, health and all and I die in the next year, okay? Now that counts as one death in one person year. So you have seven years of survival on the drug okay, versus yeah. one year of death off the drug. And that's the, that's the way they use the statistical thing to say, ultimately, you're more likely to die when you're off the drug. It's, 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 it, it really is a statistical sleight of hand. If you get into the, when, the research on when you're supposed to use person years, you're not supposed to use it in this sort of case. Yeah. Anyway, that's where it arises from. But here's let me uh, yeah. let me make a co comment on something. Yeah. Other, so many things happen when people leave a hospital on the psych drugs because I see suicides on the antidepressants in my legal practice, <clears throat> and one of the things that happens is they leave the hospital often with a, a rapid increase in the drug before they go to sort of make sure they're covered, so they're getting they're getting uh, adverse effects that aren't being observed in the hospital, or they remove the uh, cogentin or whatever drug they're giving to control the adverse effects when they, when they send them out. And the other thing is, uh, and many people who take these drugs will be aware of this, is the drugs cause this terrible akathisia, and it can well up in those first few months that you're on a new drug or have a drug increase or a drug change in dosage. So they're going out on akathisia, which is, folks, it's um, technically uh, uh, call, uh, means uh, the inability to sit still. It's actually being tortured from the inside out. Just think about something horrible torture in your body that you hope you can stop by moving. It's dreadful. And um, I actually got it once from a non-psychiatric non, uh, medication I was taking for nausea. Horrible experience. And my dose was like a tenth of the psych dose. Um, the, uh, it, it just drives people to suicide, violence, psychosis. So a lot happens during that period of time after discharge that is not taken into account by people. Well, and also the akathisia can also erupt or getting worse when you first come off as well. Yes, that's right. That's so right. You, you were setting up this peril. By the way, this is one of the things I found in this article I'm writing. So they're saying, you know, these drugs, 
reduce mortality. They help you lengthen lives. Suicide rates are four times higher than they were in the pre-antipsychotic era. So once you introduce antipsychotics, you see this extraordinary increase in suicide. In fact, in veterans patients, they did a study of VA patients from 1950 to 55, just before the first antipsychotic comes in. Suicide rates among psychiat neuropsychiatric patients were the same as in the general population at that time. Wow. 20 years later, they were eight times higher. Yeah. And it happens right after you get the antipsychotics coming in, Haldol, Thorazine, et cetera. So mm -hmm. what you're seeing here is a paradigm of care that exposes people to these risks. Yeah. And by the way, if you it's do so any, study, any study of a non-psychiatric patients on antipsychotics, it doubles their risk of mortality. So what you see here is in this story is a way to manipulate statistics to get the result they need because they needed something yeah. new to say why we're to justify yeah. prescribing practices. So that's that story, Peter. And it's um, what, what's amazing to me is how the field has glommed on to such an idiotic thing. Because you can see, you can literally see that these drugs cause changes in people's physiology that are associated with poor health. You, see it, you can see it with the first dose often, yeah. second and, dose. And yet they're willing to say to themselves, oh, these drugs must be, uh, they're, you know, they're reducing yeah. mortality. It just shows people will glom on to information that justifies what they're doing. I'll give you a little nugget that you're probably aware of that, that uh, explains how this all gets started in a way. When DeLay and Deniker, who were the big promoters of the antipsychotic drugs, gave them on the ward, they wrote in retrospect uh, that they knew on the first day that they had a tremendous new drug because the nurses said their jobs had gotten a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. So right away, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it makes you more robotic and docile and quieter, and it, and it kills your will. In a few doses, it just makes you so much more susceptible to being told what to do, to being led around. There's something about damaging the frontal lobes and the basal ganglia that also happens in Parkinson's disease uh, and that just robs you of your will. And you see it so basically in, uh, these, uh, in the antipsychotic drugs, all of them, because they all attack that uh, frontal lobes of the brain and also the basal ganglia. Yeah, and somehow people don't want to see that <laughs> in yeah. their patients, I know. Anyway, that's yeah. that story. And it's just like, um, you know, the history of psychiatry keeps repeating itself. They come up with some new story to justify what they're doing, and they never, with their somatic treatments, they just never, they never. There's a very long history, too. Yeah, um, that's what I mean. Michael, <laughs> Michael Fontaine, who's a classicist and who was uh, on my radio show last week, radio TV show last week, he uh, he did a story earlier with me and uh, that I'm going to have him come back and, and develop further, which is that the earliest classical play which is a uh, 400 BC, 4th century BC, based on a play from 200 years earlier, is making fun of physicians for diagnosing people as crazy and giving them drugs. And in the play, the uh, psychiatrist turns out to be the crazy one. So this has been going on <laughs> since earliest recorded literature. Let's. I'm. I'm glad to have a transitional smile. Let's go on and talk about this wonderful stuff in Norway that you've been so closely aligned with. And by the way, if this man is not a scientist, I don't know what he is. I mean, you just heard a great scientific summary, and my God, the uh, was it Lancet that sent you a a peer review article to review? They send them to the peers. You are a, well, oh, this is dreadful. You're a peer of the best in psychiatry. Well, that was just one time. That was the only time. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, yeah, what's happening in Norway is really interesting, Peter. And it is encouraging. Uh, you can imagine it's stirring up a lot of debate and resistance. It really comes from a, a, a survivor movement in uh, Norway that goes back to 1969. They even call themselves We Shall Overcome. And then there's some, some other survivor groups or patient groups that have formed. 
and they all can, and they don't all share the same ideology. We shall overcome is basically we don't want anything to do with psychiatry. And then there's some others that are much more modern. But they all came together. Oh, and this comes goes goes back like a decade uh, to form a coalition to say we want choice. We want the choice, actually, if we're in a hospital, not to take antipsychotics or other medications, but it really was around antipsychotics. So they petitioned for this. They held uh, meetings with the health minister. Norway has a wonderful sort of grassroots ability. It's only like five million people for, mm -hmm. uh, for ordinary people to get the ears of their political leaders. And as part of this, Peter, they did wage so on the one hand, it's an ethical thing, saying or a personal thing. We should have the choice for the type of treatment we want. But they had to also make the case that it wasn't negligent medicine, because, of course, the psychiatrist says, oh, that's negligence. That's medicine. We will be harming our patients if we don't treat them with antipsychotics. So that's where I came in. They had me come in and give talks. Um, there, there were debates. I got quite uh, roundly criticized by psychiatrists, called names. But nevertheless, that debate made it into the public view there. And the health ministry took it up. They did their own now, sort what, of... What is the dates of that? What is the dates there, Bob? Oh, this goes back to about 19, 19, 2012, 2013, I think. Oh, was it's I, by the way, I went to Norway in the early 1990s and worked with the survivor groups, gave some talks, wonderfully received. They translated my um, toxic psychiatry into Norwegian, and then uh, the publisher said that they were told that it would ruin psychiatry in Norway and they couldn't publish it. <laughs> they didn't publish it? No. Okay. Well, I was going to mention how the, one of the... There's a gentleman named Einar Plin, who's a publisher, who had his own very tragic uh, interaction with psychiatry. Lost family members to suicide and when they were put on drugs. Uh, then when he fell into deep grief over the second you know, loss, he was given antipsychotics. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> anyway, he became the publisher of like my book, Peter Gucci's book, and all these sort of very... Mm -hmm. Joanne on right. Facebook. Anyway, what happened was, at the very least, the, uh, the case was made that there are people who will do better off the medications, and therefore they should have the right not to take these medications. So the health ministry minister, this goes back about two years ago, I think, maybe even a little yeah, longer. This is really fresh stuff. Yeah. He issues a decree. He says to the four hospital districts in Norway, it's divided into four uh, you know, districts. Everyone has to set aside now beds for medication-free treatments. Now, the wow. first place that got it going was a ward up in Tromsø, Norway, uh, uh, which is, uh, I think it's above the Arctic Circle, actually. It's quite far north. Uh, and But they have a very progressive psychiatrist there named Magnus Hall. He was actually one of the people advocating for this. I went and mm -hmm. visited it. And, 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 <clears throat> It's now staffed by people who believe in this, okay? They believe they want to work with people. They have peers working there. And, and you know, Peter, the, the idea always is you go to one of these wards and there'll be people, you know, throwing things and they'll be going crazy and they'll be violent. It really wasn't like that at all. I mean, uh, no. by the way, people were free to leave, okay? If they wanted to walk into town, they could walk into town, <laughs> Uh they gathered together. There was people playing music. And they, they, I'm not saying people weren't distressed. They were suffering. And some of them had crazy ideas. But it, 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 was, it, it wasn't like when you go into a hospital today, it's like, it's like something's wrong, right? And just in terms of people being so medicated and sort of shuffling around and that sort of thing. So it's just like with being people you could yeah. be with and have sort of odd conversations or even normal conversations. It was a yeah. pleasant atmosphere. So that and it was a voluntary. Yeah. The, the hospitals, the prisons, you, even if you're a voluntary patient, you can't leave them unless the docs want you to. And this is a voluntary setting, it sounds like. And it's uh, drug free and it's caring and loving and things to do. It's all the things we've always known people need for recovery, time away, 
but also seeing your family. Sounds really good, Bob. Yeah, the only problem is there's two problems there. One, in order to get into the medication-free ward, your psychiatrist at the regular entry point has to recommend you. Mm. So you have to get uh, the recommendation from a psychiatrist who may not be happy about this. So it's hard to get the referrals. Then the other thing is, so then they are discharged. What's the type of care outside? Right. Back into a conventional care where they say you have to take your medication. Anyway, you're seeing that. That's happening in the north. There's also a group um, just outside of Oslo, two other groups that are doing great things. Uh, one is a group that started uh, withdrawing their chronic patients from antipsychotics. People who were seen as basically hopeless. And they've now got their... Is it their five-year data? I should remember this. Anyway, mm -hmm. from their first group that they withdrew over time. Now, these were chronic patients. Most of them were on multiple drugs. Something like half in that group are now asymptomatic and outside the hospital and working. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So you're seeing, and that's sort of an offshoot of this medication-free program. So finally, there's a third group that, that I just came back from this hospital in uh, the end of 2019. And this place is amazing. It was, and it, and it shows, Peter, I think, how a single sort of, uh, uh, what's the word for it, event or nudge or they come upon mm -hmm. can motivate someone to change their life and do something amazing. So this was a, um, there was a meeting in like 2015, a national meeting organized, they had a lot of psychiatric survivors and they had some providers. And one of the people there, two of the people there were, had a background as psychiatric nurses working for many years in asylums and all. And then they had gotten into housing for discharged patients. And anyway, they're there and a psychiatric survivor guy, uh, man, I forget, it might've been Walter Kahn, I'm not sure, he presents a slide that comes from Harold, it's actually my slide, that shows that recovery rates are eight times higher for the off-med group. And this guy, Ule Anderson, uh, he decided that right then and there, he's gonna do something different. So he begins meeting with psych survivor patients and he buys an old residential center and he sets up what he calls the first medication-free treatment uh, hospital in, in Europe. Now, it's actually not medication-free because what happens is to get there, you got to get a referral from a patient in a, a regular public mm -hmm. hospital. So what is he getting? He's getting the really chronic patients. And here's mm -hmm. his first patient. His first patient is a woman who's had, she's about, I think she's 31, 32. She's been hospitalized 242 times, basically been in hospital since she's 12 years old. In her last place, she had been in isolation for three years, okay? And she was on 31 drugs. So she finally gets the right to go to this private hospital. She she comes there, but it's it's a little bit um, institutional because it's an old, he bought an old institutional place. She doesn't like it. So what does he do? He says, I've got to do something different for this first patient. He takes one of his nurses and says, you and my nurse to the, this patient, why don't you go to Mallorca for two weeks? <laughs> so they go, this is a woman who came from three years of isolation. She couldn't leave her room because she was too dangerous. He said, no, nah, that's, come on. So they go to Mallorca for like two weeks. And of course now her attitude is totally different. Now, two years later, uh, she's down to one drug from 31. She's uh, now got her own apartment and she's working half time. So this is the sort of stories you're seeing of a, of a place that isn't seeing people through this disease lens and is believing that, uh, you know, you need to give people meaning in life. They need good food. They eat really well here, by the way. Mm -hmm, a lot mm -hmm. of fresh food, that sort of thing. Uh, social Caring about each other's importance, meaning, and uh, and you need to get people off the meds, and that's what they're doing. They've got. Um, I spent a few days there. They've got other people that have come off the meds that are working now, and um, what what you hear from them is, um, I came back to life. I got my life back. Yes. That sort of thing. So, 
it's struggling financially because it's a private hospital. Norway is very much a public hospital, you know, public health setting. People to get there, they have to get uh, referrals from the public health setting. You can imagine that the psych Norway Norwegian psychiatry you may remember is very conservative on the whole, very mm -hmm. biological. So there's a lot of tension debate, but it shows things are changing. Number one. Or at least there's a oh, you know a chance for change, and when you see <clears> it, you do see people are getting their lives back. I mean that's what you see. Not that things disappear; people still have problems. Okay, but but that's what you see. And Bob, you've played a big personal role in this, and uh, and in Sweden, and uh, where uh, we have the uh, open dialogue, um, you played a big role in publicizing that. That's another thing, folks, for another time that. Bob and I have both written about in our books, but you can Google open dialogue uh, in Sweden and there's scientific open, papers. Yeah, open dialogue is in Northern Finland. With, I'm with, sorry. The Sweden That's has North. like a Karina Hawkinson's. Uh, yeah, no, it's not open dialogue, it's, um, what's the, the name of it? Family, the family home therapy out of Sweden and um, dialogical well, therapy. Finland, of course, I'm talking about, I was talking about Finland. Yes, I'm exactly. sorry, I yeah. said Sweden, I yeah. meant Finland. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's more in Sweden that you just started to talk about. So the stuff going on there. Yeah, they had some, at least for a time, this residential care, which was a woman named Karina Hawkinson developed. Uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Where they, the idea was they would take discharged patients, put them with farm families, and, and, and that proved to be pretty successful. Yeah. I'll tell you a little anecdote from my volunteer days when I was uh, running the Harvard Radcliffe Mental Hospital Volunteer Program. I was like 18, 19 years old. And I managed to end up with the keys to the wards and to <laughs> sort of have a lot of like, sort of support really from different parts of the hospital and everything. And um, one day, uh, a young woman volunteer, Radcliffe student and myself, we took a large group off the women's violent ward and took them to town. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the local town outside of Metropolitan State in Waltham. And we didn't have a single act of aggression in the stores. We went, to, I think we went and gave them some money, maybe took them to a dollar store or something. And we walked around with them. And they, the word was nobody acts up at all. You get the volunteers in trouble. You don't want to get you know, Peter and Gretchen or whatever things in trouble, you know. And we brought them back without uh, any uh, incidents at all. It did not start a new policy at the hospital. <laughs> that was a bit much. People need autonomy and freedom. We see the same principles everywhere. In nursing homes, what do the people want? They want autonomy. They want to be able to make decisions. And then they want to be treated with respect and love and they want to have a life. Yeah. They want to be people. Instead, we put them on these drugs too and really hurry their death. Uh, oh, yeah. Really. So, antipsychotics, uh, what, they doubled mortality in the elderly or something like that. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a terrible situation. Um, we have just a minute or two left. Um, I'm so glad you're on the show and uh, I'd like to have you back more often. Um, any thoughts you want to leave us with about this work you're doing? I, I mean, you're obviously optimistic. That's one thing about you and me. We face evil a lot, <laughs> but we're bizarrely optimistic. <laughs> well, the reason to be optimistic here is <clears throat> we, 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 you know, psychiatry told us a very pessimistic story. Yeah. Um, brain illnesses, you're never going to get better. You just have to learn to manage your brain illness, right? Yeah. Well, it's such a, it's, it's such a wrong conception of human beings. And the, the optimism really comes from just what you said. If you give people a chance to be the author of their own lives and you help them find shelter and you help them find meaning, you treat them with decency, you, you know, you listen. And if they have crazy thoughts, that's okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and, and we're not permanent beings. So the 20-year-old the that has trouble or the 22-year-old that has trouble, that's not going to be the same person at 26 or 30. We all change. That's so important, Bob. That's so important. 
yeah, we're not fixed creatures. We move through. Yeah. And so my optimism comes from every time I know, and I know exactly what you're talking about with your program. Um, when you when you give people the chance to be the author of their own lives, and you let them still have some cognitive function <laughs> and yes. ability to engage with the world, you see they find you know so often they get better with time. They find niches in life. Maybe they're idiosyncratic. And you know if we go back to open dialogue, which really changed when in in northern Finland. 80% of their first episode psychotic patients who are working or back in school five years later and off drugs. Yeah. So Folks, we know what to do. We know what to do. And uh, join us in whatever ways you can, maybe in work and working on these issues. And take a look at Bob's uh, Madden America website, and that will get you his latest books and his latest uh, blogs and just lots of other good things and a lot of my blogs as well over time. It is so good to have you on. Thank you for doing everything you do. Robert Whitaker. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.